Welcome to Inside Hawaii Real Estate, a show dedicated to providing up-to-date information and news to Hawaii home buyers, sellers, and investors. I'm Will Tanaka with my co-host, business partner, and wife, Leonie Lam, a realtor with over 20 years experience in various leadership roles in the Hawaii real estate industry. Thanks, Will. Will is a lawyer and also the former head of a Hawaii title and escrow company, and we work together as a team full-time in real estate to bring you the latest in Hawaii real estate. And we are so excited today because we have an expert guest with us and he's going to be giving us insights into what you really need to know before getting a mortgage. So we have here with us Spencer Lee. Spencer is the vice president and sales manager at Central Pacific Bank. He has a lot of responsibilities there, but one of the most amazing things that Spencer does at Central Pacific Bank is he oversees the teams, the lending teams. So he's really overseen thousands of mortgages by this point and still continues to oversee them. So he also teaches at the Honolulu Board of Realtors. He teaches about affordable housing. And the reason he does that is because he's incredibly passionate about affordable housing. But you know, what's most important is Spencer is an amazing father and husband. So welcome, Spencer. Hi, Leone. Hi, Will. Thank you guys for having me. Great to be here with you. We're so excited to have you on, Spencer. And you know, everyone has heard of the terms mortgages. And today we're going to take a deeper dive into the world of mortgages. And last year, you know, there were over $70 billion in dollars in loans given out to homeowners just in Hawaii. I mean, that's a lot of money. And, you know, we hear about interest rates. And Spencer, let's just start with the basics. How do mortgage interest rates actually work? Yeah, that's a great question, Will. Um, mortgage interest rates, they're mostly determined by a couple of different factors. Um, I think for people watching your show, they should really know that their personal situation is going to affect the mortgage rate. So whether that be, you know, their FICO score, you know, it could be their down payment, uh, it could be the kind of property that they're buying. Um, all of these things are looked at by a bank or a lender. Um, that's one factor. Um, another factor is what's going on in the economy. Um, interest rates are kind of set by investors and you know, a lot of um, analysis goes into interest rates by banks and lenders, but, you know, the baseline is kind of w what is the market, you know, investors out there willing to pay for mortgages? Uh, so that's a big factor. Um, and also know, too, that interest rates really do come in a range. Uh, so, for example, right now, um, people can get interest rates maybe as low as 6.5% on a 30-year fix, or it could be as high as 8%. And of course, everybody wants the six and a half or anything on the lowest side, but to get there, buyers will have to pay what's called discount points. Um, and they're basically prepaying um, some money to discount the interest rate, which um, brings down their monthly payment. So they'll save some money every month. And um, there's usually a break even period, five, six, seven years into the future, uh, that it takes for them to recoup their, their discount points that they had paid up front. Um, and then after that break-even point, then they really start to save money. Um, so yeah, big picture, uh, their personal scenario, kind of what's going on in the economy and where interest rates are at. Um, and also know too that uh, there is typically a range of interest rates that people can, can select from. So people definitely want to get the lowest interest rate possible, like you mentioned. So could you kind of explain a little bit more about the discount point? Like, how does that work? Or is that like, that's a percentage of the loan amount? Or how does the discount point thing work? Yeah, great question. Um, so paying discount points is uh, really, the best analogy is like buying a solar panel system or a photovoltaic system. Um, if uh, a buyer were to a discount points up front is typically a percentage of their loan amount. So one point is 1% of their loan amount. Their loan amount is 500,000, 1% is $5,000, for example. So say a borrower were to agree to pay one point in this situation, then you might imagine that their monthly payment might go down $100 a month, right? Because they're getting a lower interest rate. Maybe they save $100 a month by getting that lower interest rate. Well, over the year, they will have saved $1,200 because they're 
12 months in a year. So after four years, um, you know, they will have saved $4,800. So if they paid, you know, $5,000 up front, it's roughly four years and two months that it will have taken for them to recoup that initial $5,000 cost um, up front. And then after that four years and two months, then they really save money because the first four years and two months, they just paid themselves back the, the $5,000 that, that they had paid up front. Um, and only after that break-even period do they really start to save money. Um, so for people who are going to live in the property for a long time, you know, they know they're not going to sell. They have a very low probability of refinancing. Those are the folks that really make the most sense to uh, pay points up front. But people who are going to sell their property right away or people who think that they can refinance before that break-even point, um, it would make less sense for them and they would likely not pay discount points. And yeah, so that means like you should just really pay attention as a borrower, like if you're looking at getting a mortgage loan to what that break-even point is going to be in your situation. Yep. Yeah, definitely. And that that's the, you know, goes along with working with a, a loan officer who can really crunch the numbers to the penny, you know, give you an exact future date in the future and kind of work with you on your specific situation and to do what makes the most sense for you. You know, earlier you talked about personal, you know, situations, you know, every individual, every family has various scenarios where, you know, whether they're making $50,000 a year, uh, $300,000 a year. And, you know, from a lender perspective, what do they actually care about when they're looking at, okay, we want to loan to this couple who has, you know, young kids. And, you know, from their perspective, it's not like, okay, we want to give them everything they want because we like them. So, so well, what's the reality? Well, what, what do banks and lenders actually care about? Yeah, great question. Um, so there's actually four standard industry pillars, if you will, in the mortgage industry. Uh, the first is the debt to income ratio. So um, what lenders are looking at is what are your monthly debts relative to your income? Uh, and by debts, we're talking about debts that would show in your credit report. So any mortgages, any credit cards, student loans, car loans, those are all debts. A lender would not be considering, you know, your cell phone bill, your grocery bill, um, you know, your Wi-Fi. So for somebody making $10,000 a month, if their housing payment plus their car loans, student loans, and credit cards might be $5,000, well, $5,000 relative to $10,000 is a debt-to-income ratio of 50%, for example. So most lenders will not want to have your debt-to-income ratio exceed 50%. Um, in, in most loan programs. Uh, the second pillar is assets. So lenders want to make sure that you have enough down payment. They also want to make sure you have enough to cover the closing costs, and they want you to have enough typically for some reserve post-closing. They want to make sure that, that you're, you still have some money after you close. The third pillar is credit worthiness. So we had mentioned FICO score. Uh, that plays a big role in whether or not you can get the loan. You're credit history, uh, your credit usage, all of those things are evaluated. And the fourth and last pillar is the collateral. So remember, the home that you're buying acts as collateral on the mortgage that you're getting. And so banks want to make sure that that's a good piece of collateral. Um, it has to be at a certain condition level, um, you know, that it's not any, that it doesn't have any safety, soundness, habitability issues. Because uh, remember, if, if you stop making your payments, then uh, the bank could take that property from you. So they want it to be in good shape. You know, let's go back to the debt to income ratio. So just kind of um, take it down to the basics. So a family makes $100,000 a year. So you're saying that with um, car payments and student loans and other types of debts, if they make 100000 their debt could be even 50000 outstanding. Is that how that works? Yeah, um, the best way to look at it is on a per month basis. Um, so I could use your 100,000 annually, but let's just make it a little easier and say $10,000 a month. Um, so in that situation, the bank would not want you to have monthly debt and housing payments that exceed $5,000 a month. Um, so that would make a ratio of exactly 50%. Um, once you 
break that 50% threshold in a lot of programs, you're disqualified. Now, also keep in mind, if you have a very low FICO score or if you're buying an investment property that's more risky, the bank might want to cap your debt-to-income ratio at 4, 000, uh, 45%, 43%. It could be 40%. Again, the, the lower your credit score um, and the riskier the loan is, then your debt-to-income ratio cap might be lower than 50%. So what I'm hearing is that credit score really matters. And then I heard you mention a couple of times FICO. So could you like kind of get into what is FICO credit score and like how, how impactful is that when you're being considered for a mortgage loan? Okay, great. Yeah, uh, FICO score and credit score are really interchangeable terms. Um, you can think of them as, as really the same thing. So when it comes to credit score, um, again, it, if you have a low enough credit score, some, you might not be able to get any mortgage whatsoever. Um, you know, depending on the lender, that cutoff might be 620, it could be 580. Um, and also just because you can get a mortgage doesn't mean that it, it's gonna be a good price. So if you do have a 620 FICO score, um, you know, just know your interest rate pricing is going to be much, much worse than somebody who has a 800 FICO score. Um, it could affect the amount of points that you have to pay. So two people with one low FICO score, one high FICO score, they might have the same interest rate, but the one with the low credit score might have to pay more discount points for that same interest rate. And yeah, having a good credit score versus having a bad credit score, it might mean the difference between getting a mortgage, uh, getting the actual home that you want, get it at the loan amount that you want, at the rate that you want. Uh, so definitely do your best to protect that credit score. Yeah. And Spencer, you know, just going back to the assets. So let's say that a family, they qualify because they qualify for the minimum debt to income ratio, but they don't have the funds and let's say that they're getting some help from family members. So if um, they want a, a gift fund or their parents are helping out, how, how, how does the, uh, the banks and lenders look at that when it's not coming from the actual lenders? I mean, the homeowners, but you know, from someone, a family member outside that's gonna be giving them down payment. Yeah, uh, great question. So First of all, let's just talk about what a down payment is. The down payment is going to be the difference between the purchase price of the unit of the home that you're buying and the loan amount. So if you're buying a $500,000 home, for example, and your loan amount is $400,000, you know, your down payment in this example is $100,000. Right? Um, typically, for a home that you're going to be occupying, we call that a primary residence, um, the full down payment can come from uh, a family member in the form of a gift, meaning no repayment is expected. Um, if you're buying a investment property, um, it, you might not be able to get any gift funds. Uh, the bank or lender might require that you get no gift funds or uh, limit the amount of gift funds that, that you can't get. Um, you know, just know that not every loan program requires a down payment or even 20% down payment. Uh, for example, VA loans for veterans, uh, active or retired are, are great mortgages uh, for our military and uh, they don't require any down payment if they don't want. Uh, USDA loans, uh, those are loans for properties in rural areas. Um, they would also be eligible for a zero down payment. Um, the government does have some other lower down payment options for people who might not have the full 20%. FHA loans come to mind where the minimum is three and a half. Uh, and Fannie and Freddie loans also have a 3% down payment option. Um, however, if you're putting down less than the full 20%, just be prepared to pay for what's called mortgage insurance. Um, MI or PMI, which stands for private mortgage insurance. Uh, that's where the home buyer has to buy insurance to cover the bank or lender uh, should you default. Um, 
Now that MI is only required on mortgages where the buyer is putting down less than 20%. And the smaller the down payment, the more expensive the mortgage insurance is uh, because the less, the, the smaller down payment um, means that it's a riskier loan. So therefore the buyer is gonna be required to pay for more mortgage insurance. Um, it's uh, definitely something to factor in because there's no free lunch. Um, putting down a lower down payment sounds great, uh, but just know that it, it does cost more money in the form of a higher monthly payment. Um, you could also get a, a second mortgage um, where your first mortgage is at 80% and maybe your second mortgage is another 5, 10, or 15%. Uh, that avoids the mortgage insurance part of it. However, you do have to pay a monthly payment for your second mortgage. Um, so again, not, not a free lunch there, but just another option. And for the mortgage insurance, you know, that a borrower may be subject to, is that something that is finite or is it like for the life of the loan? Like how does the mortgage insurance sort of payments work? Yeah, so typically the mortgage insurance payments uh, are paid in the form of a monthly additional payment amount, um, which is fixed for the duration of the time period that you have mortgage insurance. Um, it's not always the case, but that's just generally what most people go with. And in that situation, the buyer is going to be paying mortgage insurance um, for roughly seven years or so, or until uh, the loan to value gets to 80% or less um, if they don't make any additional payments. There's also a lender paid mortgage insurance where the bank would pay for the mortgage insurance cost. But as the homeowner, you have to agree to accept a higher interest rate, and that higher interest rate would be for the life of the loan. Um, that's one option. And another option is where the buyer just pays a, a large upfront cost, it's called upfront MI. Um, and if they do pay a large upfront cost, then there would not be monthly MI um, you know, on an ongoing basis because they just paid a lump sum upfront instead. So the bottom line is, as much as possible, if you could put down 20%, then we don't have to worry about the mortgage insurance or additional costs and payments for the uh, homeowners, correct? That's right. Yep. If uh, the homeowner, the buyer can put down 20%, then mortgage insurance is not required. But then also for people who don't have the 20%, like you mentioned, a whole array of different products or programs that they could a buyer could participate in so they could get into purchasing a home. That's right. If they don't have the full 20%, um, they can still buy, but they just have to be prepared to pay mortgage insurance. Okay. Always learning something new. And you know, um, it's, especially when the interest rates are so-called higher than in previous years, you know, um, I've heard a saying, you marry the house and date the rate. So in terms of refinancing, um, typically, like, how would someone know if it's time to refinance? Is it just because lower interest rates um, from their current loan rate, or what? What? What should go into analysis from uh, a homeowner's perspective? Yeah, that, I, I love this question because I think a lot of people are confused about it. Um, First and foremost, you need to know what your existing interest rate is. Um, and then after you know what it is, then you can hope, wait for a time period where interest rates are lower. And then we can do uh, some simple math to see if it makes sense for you to refinance. Anytime you refinance, there are always closing costs. There's many third parties that need to get paid for their services like title, escrow, um, the lender, the appraiser, full credit, the list goes on and on. Um, it varies what those closing costs is on every transaction because it's always specific to the property. But let's just ballpark and say on average, it's $5,000. What we would do is just look at interest rates at some point in the future and see if the amount that you're saving every month will make up for the $5,000 upfront cost in a reasonable time period. 
So again, let's take, for example, somebody who might refinance and they would save $100 a month by refinancing. Um, say their interest rate is 7.5% and they go to 7.25. And by doing so, they save $100 a month. Well, again, $100 a month means $1,200 for the year. And if closing costs were $5,000 to refinance, it would take four years and two months to recoup your upfront costs. In that situation, the buyer may decide to refinance or they might not. Um, typically, anything less than five years, it starts to make sense. Um, anything over five years of a, a break-even point, uh, I would advise not refinancing. Um, some people want to hold off and, and you know, wait for a time period where interest rates are going to be low enough such that they'll recoup their closing costs. Uh, in two years or three years, everybody's a little bit different. Um, some people are, you know, serial refinancers and, and happy to refinance down and down, um, you know, a quarter of a point uh, each time. But, um, you know, just know that there's costs associated with that. So, you know, generally speaking, I would say if you could recoup your closing costs um, about five years or less, uh, it, it makes sense. Um, and even for a VA loan, it, if it took more than five years to recoup your closing costs, the, the VA wouldn't even let somebody do that um, using a VA loan program. For the refinancing, is it true, like, if the rate came down, like, by one percentage point, is that a good time to refinance, or is that, like, a myth? Uh, that is definitely a heavy truth, where if you're saving one percentage point, um, you should definitely refinance. Um, you know, even if you're saving a half, it, it starts to make sense. So uh, let's say somebody is um, has a $500,000 loan amount and they can drop their interest rate by one point. Well, one, one percentage point on, um, you know, 500,000, uh, on a $500,000 loan will, would be $5,000, right? So roughly in a year's time, you, you would be saving that uh, that amount of um, closing costs. So, yeah, your break-even point is roughly a year in, in that um, situation, so you should definitely do it. And, you know, like right now, one of the hot topics is um, affordable housing. And there's some new, you know, uh, construction, new um, development here in uh, on the island of Oahu. And if people are interested in getting a mortgage, on affordable units. Is it a different process? Is it the same process? How do banks and lenders um, look at affordable units versus um, just the regular market rate units? Yeah, so affordable units come with additional deed restrictions and resale restrictions. Um, if somebody is buying an affordable unit, it's mostly the same process as um, you know buying a non-affordable unit. Um, the lender might be involved with the eligibility check because the uh, housing finance agency, the, the agency that's offering the affordable unit, uh, might require that the lender do some eligibility checking, but it's mostly the same um, it, big picture uh, for a purchase mortgage. For refinances, however, they are very different. Uh, the lender is heavily involved with working with the local financing agency, the housing financing agency, um, in getting approval to even do the refinance. Um, I think in either instance, I, I would definitely recommend that the buyer of the home or the person refinancing work with a local bank or lender who's familiar with affordable mortgage, you know, mortgages on affordable properties, um, just because the lender is going to be working with the, the local housing agency. So um, I think it is important to work with a, a local person um, for those mortgages. And, you know, for those thinking about getting a mortgage loan, are there any pitfalls or anything that you could kind of share with us, some insight that they could try to avoid? Yeah, um, I definitely advise people to not overcommit when getting a mortgage. Um, it's very easy to... Um, get a mortgage that the bank might be willing to give you, but then you're uncomfortable with the housing payment. 
Um, so in those situations, you know, being house poor, uh, meaning you have uh, a nice house, but then you don't have very much money uh, to, to live a normal life uh, every month it is not, not a good situation to be in. Um, you know, I think that working with a good mortgage loan officer is very important because, you know, I feel like the advice that I give people is, is very similar to what a financial advisor might advise people on, um, you know, financial advice, life advice, you know, steering people in the right direction. Um, I think that's important. And I think that borrowers need to really understand the terms of the mortgage that they're buying. You know, I'm sure there's no prepayment penalties. Um, you know, ensure that there's no change in interest rate along the way, um, you know, locking your loan off. All of those things are really important. You know, and keep in mind that if you don't pay your mortgage, the bank could foreclose on your property, meaning take it away from you. Um, so you definitely don't want to take on more debt than you can afford. Um, you want to make sure you have good job security because you need that job to pay your mortgage. Um, you know, it's not always the case that home prices go up. Uh, they could go down and you don't want to be put in a position where you have to sell your home um, you know, just because you can't afford it and, and maybe take a loss where you're selling it for less than what you bought it for. Um, if you do have late payments, then it's going to affect your credit score. So um, we don't want that. Make sure you work with a reputable lender. Uh, somebody who's getting a referral from, from somebody you know and trust is a great idea. And just ask lots of questions throughout the process. Um, so that you're not confused, that you feel good about what's going on, um, that you fully understand everything. Um, you know, a good banker lender will be transparent about all of their uh, things that they're doing for you. Wow, that was a jam-packed show, Spencer. The VP and sales manager of Central Pacific Bank. You were amazing. Thank you so much for being on our show. Thank you, Spencer. You guys are so kind. Thank you for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you so much and aloha. Aloha.